Well, welcome everybody to our discussion of the general audience of Pope Francis from Wednesday, June 19th, 2024, on the cycle of catechesis, The Spirit and the Bride. It's titled, The Holy Spirit Guides the People of God Towards Jesus, Our Hope. The Spirit Teaches the Bride to Pray, the Psalms Symphony of Prayer in the Bible. My name is Father Stephen Worzeski. I'm a Franciscan friar to your war ministering at St. Francis University in Loretto, Pennsylvania. And I'm joined by my brother, Father Dan Worzeski of the Diocese of Pittsburgh. Hello. It's good to be with you all. So today, as we're looking at Pope Francis's general audience, I love that he starts with the analogy of the great symphony of prayer as the Psalms. Just thinking of a symphony, it says in the second paragraph, there's different movements and there's different genres of prayer. I think of, and one of my friars says this sometimes, is that the Psalms themselves, especially the ones we pray in the liturgy, the hours, they encompass all emotions, from joyful praise of God to lament to sometimes we pray in the liturgy, the hours, the Psalms that are like, oh my gosh, they've broken into the sanctuary and set up their foreign emblems, like this lament of of the difficulties that the, the people of Israel are, are struggling with, it really encompasses is all emotions. And I love that because the Psalms can very much become a prayer that we can turn to in our difficulties. Or, as one of my other friars says, God rest his soul, his name is Father Dominic Scotto, uh, T-O-R. He says that the Psalms, when we pray them, even if we're not going through that specific thing at emotion or or difficulty that the psalmist is writing about we're praying that on behalf of others in the church and asking the lord to bless those who are going through the difficulty or whatever that is that the psalmist is praying for so sometimes people when they're praying the psalms are like well i don't relate to that or oh you know that's not what i'm going through well, we're doing that sometimes on behalf of others I'm going to pause here because I could talk about this for a while, but I want to ask my brother, Father Dan, to kind of chime in on thoughts on some of those things about the Psalms as symphony of prayer. Amen. Thanks, Stephen. And just for clarification, yeah, I'm his biological brother and blood brother and uh, just got assigned to as a parochial vicar at Saints Martha and Mary in the North Hills. So excited for that. Yeah, I love this analogy of the spirit and the bride. I feel like almost every other time I'm on WAOB, I love to talk about what John Paul II said at the uh, one of his last World Youth Days. When you speak to God, talk to him as if you'd speak to a friend. And to me, that means expressing those emotions. So when I'm trying to help people to pray and to get those emotions, especially those negative ones who are not good at expressing oftentimes or even letting out, let alone in, in virtuous ways, to say that, you know, to the Lord, you know, I'm feeling frustrated, I'm feeling angry, I'm feeling sad, have that permission to get it out with the Lord, but in a particular way, you know, the spirit and the bride, you know, we're thinking about the church as the bride of Christ. I just had a wedding at uh, St. Paul Cathedral, and it was wonderful. The groom was actually from the UK, and the bride had grown up around here, but it was living there now. And just to see that love between them and how you have to communicate well, and how often, and Pope Francis will talk a little bit more about a soldier later on, how often did people really treasure, especially during the dating relationship, and if we think especially of soldiers in war, huh? those love letters, those giving and receiving of those movements of the heart and how they hold on to those to keep them going, both the oftentimes party in the war and then the party at home as well, that connection, how they feel free to share, whatever. So Pope Francis talks about a couple of different genres of prayer, huh? praise, thanksgiving, which are more positive, supplication, lamentation, which can be some of our negative emotions, narration, just telling God, even though he already knows, creating that bond with him as we speak to him, as if we speak to a friend, sapiential reflection, you know, thinking about the wisdom, what's going on in our lives, the symbols of what's going on and what is the deeper meaning. And how that really draws us closer to him. And then ultimately, the church as a whole, the bride talking with the Lord, the bridegroom. And that 
is one way also of looking at that symphony of prayer, not just just all the different emotions, but as well all the different people speaking to God as a friend. So I'll close that reflection with that. I like it. I like it, especially focusing in on the different movements of prayer. Really honing in on what you said, you know, we got to share ourselves with God and share our hearts with Him. Amen. You know, I often say that to the students here I work with is, you know, God wants us all. He wants our hearts. He doesn't just want the pretty things. <laughs> and Jesus said that to St. Faustina. I quote that all the time to my students too. He says, you know, when St. Faustina said, you know, I've given you everything, God. And, and God says, no, you, you've held back some stuff. And she said, well, what have I haven't given? And Jesus says to her, well, give me your misery. Give me your pain. Give me your brokenness. Mm. Give me those parts you don't want to share. That's, that's where he wants to meet us. And so the Psalms can be beautiful vehicles of that, which Pope Francis says later. And one of the points he says, hey, if you're sorry for your sins, right? When, it says, when you are a bit sad for having sinned, for example, do you pray Psalm 51? It says, there are many psalms that help us keep going. From the habit of praying with the psalms, I assure you that you will be happy in the end. And I think that's a key point there, because if you look at the psalms a lot, a lot of times, even if they're dealing with a lot of the difficulties, they end with a resolution of, but I will trust in you, Lord, or you will be my peace and my surety. There's something that even whenever the psalmist is expressing all of the difficulties and the pains and the sufferings and the, and the, uh, the trials, he usually comes to a resolution of, but you are with me, Lord, and I know that you will carry me through. Mm-hmm. There's something powerful about that. So when Pope Francis says, I assure you that you'll be happy in the end when you're praying the Psalms, I think he's he's really making a nice homage to how David and the other writers of the Psalms would pray. Pouring out their hearts, they're filled with the surety that God is with them, that they will have his companionship even in the midst of suffering to give it such value, right? Because we don't suffer alone when we're with God. And when we give it to God, he walks with us and gives us hope amidst any affliction. Oh, yeah. Right on the money there. I often like to tell people that in the Psalms, right, it's a model for prayer that either the psalmist hears from God that it's going to be okay, or even if he doesn't hear from God, he experiences that peace and consolation of God in a way, because you see at the end his tone changes, even if he is saying, God, where are you? All the unjust are receiving this glory and they have dug a pitfall for me. But then what does it end with? Something like, yet I will trust in the Lord. He is my strength and my shield or whatever it might be in that psalm. One inject a little bit of humor here. He talks about how at times, the Psalms can reflect a historical context and religious mentality that are no longer ours. I remember at our household program at St. Vincent, we would make a commitment to go pray with the monks every um, Sunday evening. And there were two Psalms that always bring a smile to our faces, and they don't really relate much to nowadays. But one was about uh, how good it is when brothers dwell in unity. It's like oil flowing down upon the beard. And I always thought that was an interesting uh, image there. I used to anoint kings and prophets and priests like that uh, upon the beard of Aaron, his robes. But the perhaps more humorous one was there was a part of a psalm talking about one of the warrior type psalms where talking about God being our strength. And they were talking about heads being shattered far and wide. And of course, that's an image that would really resonate with young men. And the monks would sing it in such a very beautiful voice, you know, like heads will be shattered far and wide. That always brought a smile to my face to see that image and how peaceful the contrast between <laughs> the way the monks sang it so prayerfully and what those words mean. But yes, yeah, some of the things in the Psalms, you know, were beyond that time where uh, we're not in a time of war right now, and we often, I hope, resolve difficulties and disagreements in a much more peaceful and civil way, looking to love others. But yet those emotions behind that psalm, uh, desiring for God to um, be our victor, to fight for us, to resolve our problems, still things that are timeless 
I think the Pope makes a good distinction about that. There are sometimes some historical context or religious mentality is no longer ours, but yet those things behind it, huh? that desire for protection, desire for the Lord to bring about the victory and justice, those are timeless. Mm -hmm. So I'm the postulant director for our TOR. The postulants are the first year. You know, I teach the brothers how to pray the liturgy of the hours. And one of the things I talk about, which is quoting from uh, one of the, the uh, descriptions of one of the Liturgy of the Hours, um, it says that through praying the Psalms or praying the prayer of Jesus, and even Pope Francis speaks a little bit of this, that Jesus and Mary and the apostles and Christian generations that came before us prayed the Psalms. Mm -hmm. But we're putting the Word of God in our mouths, in the power of the Holy Spirit, praying the prayer of Jesus to the Father. Mm. So it's a very Trinitarian aspect of us giving ourselves and praying to the Lord, offering up that prayer of praise and thanksgiving or supplication or all those types of prayer that Pope Francis speaks of. We're doing it because Jesus did it too. It's a great, great prayer. And so there's a closeness to it. Because sometimes people say to me, you know, Father Stephen, I know the church prays these liturgy of the hours, but why do we got to pray those psalms? And I'm like, because Jesus did it is one of the answers sometimes I give. But um, some other times I say, well, we're, we're putting the word of God in our mouth as a prayer. Like Jesus is the word of God and, and the scriptures are divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit. So we are being drawn into the life of the Trinity with our prayer and uh, as, a, as a sacrifice, as an offering to the Father. Yeah, he kind of speaks exactly what you're saying. So unlike other prayers, psalms do not lose their effectiveness by being repeated. On the contrary, they increase it. Why? Because they are inspired by God and breathe God every oh, time they're breathe. read with faith. And so, yeah, I underline breathe in my copy here, like thinking of the Holy Spirit, kind of that ancient way of looking at creation happening, that God the Father is the creator and Jesus Christ or at that time before he took on the flesh, the Son is the Word through whom the universe is created. And the Holy Spirit is that breath by which the Word is spoken. And so for us, you know, speaking in example, following example of Jesus, those Psalms, and the breath through which we pray those Psalms to the Father is the Holy Spirit. So I think you're right on the money. And as we do that, you know, on uniting those different emotions, whether we can relate with them or not, with God the Father and letting the Holy Spirit bring them to God the Father, I think brings a lot of healing and peace. And one thing that's often got me a lot of consolation is I think sometimes when the Liturgy of the Hours feels perhaps heavy or burdensome or, or boring, I think sometimes that's because the church as a universal body, we're praying that all together, especially if you're feeling relatively good when you're praying emotionally. Perhaps God's using that to help bear the burden of somebody else and bring that to him so that we can be healed. And I think that's often the times that we might feel the heaviness or the burden where we feel good because when we feel bad, we pray the liturgy of the hours, so much, much consolation and peace and healing. And that's my own thought that kind of helps me through some of the more dry times is to think, well, not only is this helping me get closer to the Lord, but it's helping to bear the burden somewhere else in the church. I may never meet who the people are that we're praying for, although we have our own private intentions, but it's helping them. It's lifting them out of the dregs closer to the Lord and his consolation. Truly. Yeah, I think that is a beautiful way to say it. I want to focus a little bit here towards the end of his reflection. Mm-hmm. He says, the Psalms help us to open ourselves to a prayer that is less focused on ourselves. A prayer of praise, a blessing of thanksgiving. And they also help us give voice to all creation involving it in our praise. But I want to talk about that. The Psalms help us to open ourselves to a prayer that is less focused on ourselves. 
Because mm. sometimes we can go into prayer and it becomes all about asking for things, right? It can, a lot of times people will be like, well, you know, I don't even know how to pray. All I do is just ask God for stuff. Mm -hmm. And we know that prayer is not just about asking. Sometimes it can become very much focused on that if we're going through something tough or, you know, at earlier stages in our prayer lives. But I love how it gets us out of ourselves, right? It's less mm -hmm. focused on ourselves and more about being like God. Father Casey Cole, he's a OFM, he has this one video about why do we pray, and I show it in my freshman class that I teach here at St. Francis University. I'm not teaching it this year because I have um, a couple other responsibilities that have crept up. I wish I could be in the classroom, but it's not allowing for that right now. But I, when I teach about prayer, I show this video, and, and one of the things is, well, why do we pray? And we don't pray that God may just give us things or we make God like us, he says. But he says, we pray because we want to be more like God and we want God to make us more like him. We pray so that our minds might be in union with his, that we may be changed. Instead of it being about our desires, telling God what to do. God, why don't you just do this? God, I need you to do this. And we can get into that mindset sometimes of, if you don't do this, God, then do you really love me? Like you put those if then statements or, you know, God, why don't you answer the prayers I want them to? And it's, it's not just about, Hey, God, do it this way, but rather God, help me to be in deep relationship with you. I'm going to get out of myself. Lord, help my mind and my heart to be in union with yours. Mm -hmm. That's far more powerful than just saying, give me this, give me that. And I think Pope Francis, he's kind of getting into that with this reflection. He says, open ourselves to a prayer that is less focused on ourselves. And then finally, he ends his reflection today with, you know, just a, a wrap-up statement to, to make this year of preparation for the Jubilee a true symphony of prayer. So his encouragement to continue that prayer and to let the Psalms be a prayer of our hearts as well. Yeah, I think any time that we can... Uh get a focus off ourselves makes us better people uh you know the lord first others second and then yourself third you know jesus others you j-o-y i love that a couple of thoughts about what he said first of all giving voice to all creation so i thought of you Stephen, in the franciscan way the other canticle of creation thinking of you know the whole world in a way in our humanity you know helping all of creation kind of being a bridge a priest of the small p, you know, between God and the rest of creation, bringing it to the Lord as it desires to give God glory. Funny story about Father Casey. I was in seminary with him at Catholic U, and maybe you were as well. And mm -hmm. uh, I remember at one of my parishes, because he's really blown up on YouTube, and they're saying, oh, Father Casey Cole has this video about that. And I was like, oh, yeah, I was in seminary with him. And they couldn't believe it. They're like, what? No, there's no way you could have been in seminary with him. He's that YouTube star. So I was a little humorous when I think about Father Casey's an amazing job of catechizing and bringing so many people to the Lord uh, by using the gifts and the talents he has in the modern media love this says the deer longs for running streams you know so my soul longs for thee my god or talks about here dry and weary land there's sometimes we really really desire the lord we find out or we realize when there's quiet or when we're not busy how desperate we are how much off balance we are and we need the lord to bring us to him and he talks about this 23rd psalm which the Lord is my shepherd. There's nothing I shall want. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. And that's part of the prayers before death. I do a lot of anointings, whether primarily doing that or doing that secondarily in an assignment. There's always that need in the diocesan priesthood. And for some people, when it is clear, it's the time of death, there's a beautiful liturgy uh, that the church has starts off with these very comforting short bible verses and then there's an opportunity for a reading and i will often choose the 23rd psalm and then an opportunity to have the litany of the saints to pray for many people starting with the patriarchs those in the old testament prophets and all the way through some modern saints to pray for the beloved and for their deliverance from evil and to be placed in the Lord's arms and a beautiful prayer of commendation. So I don't often do that, probably only about 10% or less of anointings because we that's often for when it's clear the person's going to die. 
but so beautiful in that psalm, 23rd psalm, just ingrained in a, such a beautiful psalm for us as Americans to really uh, draw close to the Lord. Lastly, had a great time at the National Eucharistic Congress. That was an amazing thing. But afterwards, uh, so many of us were thinking, well, what's next, right? And I'm glad you brought that up, huh? The year preparation for the Jubilee. That's, that's right. That's something that's next. And I'm sure we'll talk about that later. So I'll close my comments there because we have another uh, audience to look at as well. Sounds good. So let's move to our second audience for today. This one was from August 7th. It's uh, the Spirit and the Bride as well. But it says, the Holy Spirit guides the people of God towards Jesus, our hope. So number five, incarnate by the work of the Holy Spirit from the Virgin Mary, how to conceive and bear Jesus. Just that title right there is so beautiful, how how to conceive and bear Jesus. Uh, even St. Francis of Assisi himself, he talks about you know, how we can be mother of Christ when we let the word of God dwell in us and, and mm. give birth in us through our works of charity and how we live. And so I was already thinking of that whenever I'm looking at the title. I'm like, oh, that's very much in uh, uh, our St. Francis, our Franciscan tradition. So just wanted to throw that out at the beginning to say that. But um, you had mentioned in the past audience about the breath of the Holy Spirit the bottom mm-hmm. of the first page, Pope Francis says, Just as he was born by the Holy Spirit from a virgin mother, so he makes the church, his unblemished bride, fruitful with the life-giving breath of the same Spirit. I love that. Life-giving mm-hmm. breath. Fruitfulness Amen. of the life-giving breath. You know, uh, we say at the end of the creed, well, not the end, but at the part where we're talking about the Holy Spirit, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. Mm. Right. And God breathed into the nostrils of that first man when he made him right in the second creation story in Genesis. He breathed in him the breath of life. Mm. So I wanted to focus again on that, that it's uh, his unblemished by the church becomes fruitful with the life giving breath of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. My thoughts were more about uh Mary kind of being the spouse of the Holy Spirit and how she is a model for the church as bride, especially because today is the assumption as we're recording this. And uh, speaking with one of my brother priests at the fraternity of priests, we meet up to support each other. He was speaking about how Mary being, you know, assumed body and soul into heaven, how she does first And she's an example of what we are called. We believe in the resurrection of the body. Well, how does that Mm -hmm. happen? Little by little, like Mary, even though she was conceived without sin, she had to choose God all the time. And she chose to let him dwell in her by saying yes to the angel, saying yes to the Holy Spirit. And even when she didn't understand everything, and that's what I One of the favorite things of mine about Mary, huh? She didn't always understand. And what did she do? She pondered these things in her heart. So she was still obedient. She still tried to make sense of things. She didn't just say, okay, that's it. But um, she wasn't disobedient. Say, well, I can't control this. I don't understand this. I'm not going to do it. Uh, No, she continued to move forward. So thinking about that, in connection, as I was chatting with some of the staff in preparation for this, with the Eucharist, huh? how intimate is that when we receive Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity, of course, where Jesus is, uh, there is the Father and the Holy Spirit as well. You can't separate them in a sense. That intimate moment of just receiving the Lord and how we receive him Little by little, that word to whom the universe was created, we are transformed little by little. And God desires that we be saved. He desires that all be saved if we call upon his name. And that as we're transformed little by little, unlike other food we eat, which becomes part of us, when we eat him, we become more like him. We become more uh, in him, dwelling in him. And someday uh, when we're able to be able to follow where Our Lady went, that full active receptivity and being in heaven. So that would be my part of my reflection. We'll talk more about it later, but just 
a friend of mine was challenging me lately because the Lord blessed me with something really amazing. And I'm just like the good Catholics. Instead of fully receiving it, I was just like, oh, I don't feel like I deserve this. I feel guilty. I feel like, you know, life always needs to be hard and I always need to be striving, as I'm sure many of us good Catholics do. And she's like, stop, Father Dan. She's a real woman of prayer. Think about Our Lady. Think about her active receptivity. Allow the Lord to love you. Um, without that striving, without that earning, just allow him to love you in this blessing. And I was like, wow, that's powerful stuff. It's what I needed to hear. And I think that's what so many of us need to hear. That's right. That's right. Just let the Lord work in us. Pope Francis speaks of, I love how he quotes Lumen Gentium. Mm -hmm. You know, Lumen Gentium is that document from Vatican II about the church, a light to the nations. And Lumen Gentium has a very nice paragraph, well, not even paragraph, it's a whole chapter on Mary as mother of the church. And so Pope Francis is quoting from there. It says, by her belief and obedience, Mary brought forth on earth the very son of the father showing in an undefiled faith, not in the word of the ancient serpent, but in that of God's messenger, right? God's messenger, mm -hmm. the, the, the angel Gabriel. You know, behold, you'll conceive and bear a son. The church mm -hmm. indeed, contemplating her hidden sanctity, imitating her charity, and faithful, faithfully fulfilling the father's word, will, by receiving the word in faith, becomes herself a mother. We can become... A mother, Pope Francis is saying, if we receive the word of God and let it take hold in us. By her preaching, she brings forth to a new and immortal life the sons who are born to her in baptism, conceived of the Holy Spirit and born of God. So something about the church as the sacrament of salvation, as Monsignor McPartland would say, mm -hmm. uh, it was a seminary professor that both Father Dan and I had at the Catholic University in America. Mm -hmm. He has a whole book called The Sacrament of Salvation. Now, obviously, that's a quotation of from Lumen Gentium of the Church as the Sacrament of Salvation, right? Um, you know, we can be born in the Church. We're born to her in baptism. We're, we're like conceived of the Holy Spirit and born of God, and we're able to do that too, to bring forth, to, to hear the word of God and, uh, and to bring forth fruit in that. Um, he finishes, he says, Pope Francis even says, let's conclude with a practical ref reflection for our life, um, especially on the verbs to conceive and to bear. And he says, Mary conceived, then born Jesus. First, she welcomed him into herself in her heart and flesh, then she gave birth to him. And I love that. It's first welcoming Jesus and then giving birth to him. You know, there's a period of time from receiving the word of God that we need to let it take over our lives before we can bear fruit, right? In the mm -hmm. discipleship model that focused the Fellowship of Catholic University students that I work with, that they, they do their, their discipleship model is, well, let's convince people, let's win them over to Christ, and then we have to build them up before we send them out to do the good work. Just like when Jesus called his apostles, he invited them, and he built them up with teaching, and then he sent them forth to preach. And so like, we can't give birth to Jesus, you know, if we're using this analogy, without first welcoming him into ourselves and letting him build us up so that we can go out and share him, right? And so I think that's important. And uh, as Franciscan friars, we even say, you know, our, our ministry is, is fully powered by our prayer. It flows out of our prayer and it flows back into it. If we try to do any of the ministry and the work we do without a deep relationship with God and without praying, we're, we're sharing more of ourselves, but not the good parts of ourselves. And we want to let Jesus shine through ourselves, right? We want to share that part of ourselves, like being so full of Christ that we can share him with others as we share ourselves, not the other way around. We think we're doing the Lord's work, but we're just sometimes sharing, you know, what we think we ought to do. It becomes, becomes, uh, you know, running on empty if you want to use a, a, uh, gas analogy, uh, analogy <laughs> of a vehicle, right? Yeah, so, we can relate. 
And I think we can all relate, right? <laughs> How many of us in ministry or in work where we're like, I want to share, share Jesus, but I just want to do it all without praying. And it's like, the, we're, me- we're missing it. <laughs> missing the point. Or, or the, the one temptation as clergy, many of us have fallen into is, Oh, well, I'm just so busy. I don't have as much time to pray. And it's like, well, that's the, that's the lifeblood. That's what helps us to do the ministry well. <laughs> and if we're just Amen. cutting out some of the prayer, we're not going to be able to give birth to the Lord in the world. We're not going to be able to be good ministers. So I, I share that by saying, pray for your priest that he may have a deep relationship with God. Pray for us because sometimes we get tempted to to cut some of our prayer time whenever we get busy. And it's like, you know, I'm saying this on the radio here to even encourage myself. Yeah, make sure to have that primacy of prayer. That's what's so important for seeking to 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 live Christ, to share Christ. So uh, that's a long, long bit of me sharing there, but I get very passionate. Oh, you're right on the money. And I was thinking we can all relate because even those who don't have the gas cars, even those with the electric cars, right? <laughs> Things wear down, right? Or even if you don't have a car, your cell phone, right? Uh, wear down. It's got to be recharged. And yeah, that's a whole nother conversation about almost a uh, being addicted to ministry for some of us in mm-hmm. uh, active ministry. Oh, we want to do this. And there's so much work to be done and this and this and this. And then we're tempted to place ourselves in the, in the place of the savior. Um, we need to be humble. And even Christ showed us in his humanity. What did he do before, after a big time of ministry, he went alone with the Father to pray. And I got to believe taking on that humanity that he voluntarily accepted, letting the Father recharge him up. Um, I was looking up real quick as you were speaking, you know, the definition of a sacrament. I love those kind of quick, clear definitions. So going back to the old Baltimore Catechism, an outward sign instituted by Christ to give grace. I remember in seminary, we were a little bit uh, scandalized by the kind of edgy way that our rector at Theological College uh, talked about the eighth sacrament, you know, the church. <laughs> we're like, whoa, whoa, what is this? There's only seven sacraments, right? So the church is in a sacrament in the same way as the seven sacraments are sacraments. It's not a eighth uh, sacrament you can receive, but what does it do? Like those seven sacraments. It is the outward sign instituted by Christ to give grace. It's the kind of visible manifestation of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven Mm -hmm. in our world. And we get to be part of that as baptized Catholics. So that's pretty neat. I I was just just, teaching uh, some nuns, some local nuns. Sorry to interrupt, but I'm teaching some local sisters um, a class on Vatican II. And I was just teaching about Lumen Gentium yesterday and was using that, the same, same words like, yeah, the sacrament of salvation doesn't mean that the church itself is one of the seven, but it's the vehicle, right? It's the vehicle mm-hmm. with which the grace comes, comes to us. It's set up by Jesus and it's the outward sign to communicate the invisible realities, right? I know you love that word reality whenever mm-hmm. we're talking about sacraments and mysteries but anyway sorry to interrupt but i just saying that resonates with me because i'm like yeah yeah just teaching this yesterday <laughs> yeah yeah we also think about uh father morosevich who we saw at the national eucharistic congress uh who was head of theology department for a while he liked to say the word reality so kind of a trip down memory lane but anyhow um yeah i'll just close with a couple thoughts one i love that he talks about um Acts 1.8, you shall receive yes. power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And the Holy Spirit's for everyone. You know, I want to disambiguate this myth. Oh, it's only for the holy saints or it's only for the charismatics. No, the Holy Spirit's for everybody and it doesn't need to be anything weird or strange. It is the breath of God. And the more we give the Lord permission to work through us, the more he will. And we heard at the Eucharistic Congress how God can work miracles even in the presence of of just being with the Eucharist. Mother Olga had these great talks, and you got to believe that the Holy Spirit is part of that as the Lord brought healing to so many who needed it. And lastly, you can't help but think any time you hear at the end, huh? with God, nothing will be impossible, or nothing is impossible with God. That's uh, our bishop here in Pittsburgh, Bishop David A. Zubik, one of his favorite uh, lines to quote from Scripture. huh? Nothing is impossible with God. And man, how many times have we 
put it in a box or this will never change or God can't even change that or this will always have to be like this or even our own wills as vows they call them it has to be this way and how many times how God breaking down those barriers and bringing healing bringing new life breathing uh, new life into so many situations I don't think that'll ever get old so I'll close with that reflection and let you take it away yeah, I like your reflection, especially with nothing will be impossible with God. When we have the Holy Spirit truly empowering us, we'll be able to do great things, some that we didn't even know possible, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I love talking about when the Holy Spirit, you know, came down onto the apostles and the, the church was made manifest that day on Pentecost because you see it very directly in the way that St. Peter preaches. Right? He was the guy who denied Jesus just a couple weeks before that. And then when he's filled with the Holy Spirit, when he repented, obviously, but after he's filled with the Holy Spirit, he's able to articulate so boldly and meaningfully and under the power of the Holy Spirit that conversions happen. Mm. Great things can happen when we give ourselves totally to God and ask the Holy Spirit to work through us. And so that's a good place, I think, for us to close our reflections today is inviting our listeners today to ask the Holy Spirit to fall afresh on you this day, to empower you with courage and fortitude to live the faith well, to let the Lord dwell deeply in you, and that you may be inspired to bring forth love, His love, the love of Christ, to the world through how you live, through how you share Christ, how you even preach when called upon or the moment allows for you to share Christ, to preach Him and to do all that he asks us to do to become the holy people that that the world so desperately needs. You know, there's a temptation sometimes to be like, well, my faith is just something I have to do privately, right? We see this mm-hmm. lie out there in the culture a lot that says, oh, well, you know, don't intimidate someone with your faith. That's good for you, but it's it's it should just be private. And it's like, well, no, the faith itself is meant to be shared. Love grows when it's given away. The apostles were sent out. When Jesus, right before he ascended to heaven, he gave them three things to do. He said, you know, go teach all I told you. Make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He's called us to share in his work. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, may we be able to share in his work, to share him with the world, to bring people into relationship with God and to walk along the path of eternity with peace and with joy. Amen. So let us end with a quick prayer for our listeners for the Holy Spirit. We pray, Come, Holy Spirit, and fill our hearts, fill the hearts of the faithful, fill the hearts of each of the people listening. Help them to have the confidence, the courage, the conviction, and the clarity to share you with the world. May they bring forth your love in the world may they bear you may they be overshadowed by your spirit lord that they may be great witnesses of your love to the world lord fill the listeners especially those who struggle with any type of of timidity or fears or anxieties about sharing the faith fill them with confidence and courage fill them with your love fill them with your strength this day fill them with fortitude to bear whatever sufferings for the sake of the name and to keep tirelessly proclaiming the truth. Bless them with your Holy Spirit and continue to bless all of us who listen with the peace and the surety of knowing your love and help us to share that love with the world. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And may Almighty God bless each of you listening, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thank you all for joining us. We really love doing this. Two priest brothers loving Mm -hmm. to share the word of God. So thank you, and we wish you all the best this day. Amen. God's peace.